What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Mike Dolce Show. Today we have one of the world's top strength and conditioning coaches in the sport of mixed martial arts, Mr. Phil Daru. Let me sit there, bro. Um, you said that um, all right, just big, let's do this. Big Boston people out of their seats. <laughs> <laughs> hey, he's actually he's, he's a good dude. He'll 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 let me borrow his seat for now. There you yeah. go. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> cool. What's up, bro? Where you at right now? Gym time. I'm actually at my facility in Port St. Lucie, Florida. It's a uh, Treasure Coast Barbell. Okay. Um, getting after it. I was I was actually getting ready waiting on you to do this interview and then we're also going to be doing some youtube videos and things like that getting uh get some things out there for the people right on man um trailer coast what's what's the name of the gym treasure coast treasure so, coast. yeah treasure coast barbell it's in uh port st Lucie, florida um it, it's not a uh it's not a yoga gym definitely not we got some we got some music playing in the background this is my side right here. So as you can see, we got strongman equipment yep. going down there. And then uh, if I go to the other side, you'll see more of the powerlifting side where we got platforms and all the other equipment there wow. as well. This is a big gym. This is a nice gym. Yeah. Yeah. We uh, we what? just opened up this side, yep. which was pretty cool. You know, um, now I can do things like conditioning, especially for the uh, for the athletes. And uh, we do boot camps too as well. So it's always good to have, you know, like a uh, different levels of, of different things that we need you know what i mean especially when it comes down to overall strength and conditioning so it gives me the ability to do this um as optimal as i can you know sure sure and you said that you have the high athletes there but you also have boot camps and, and classes and things like that group fitness classes yeah for people that aren't stepping into the octagon right yeah yeah i mean this is primarily more the general pop you know we got we have Anywhere from, uh, you know, regular high school kids all the way up into, you know, soccer moms, man. So they come in, they get it in, and they're, and they're in a good environment. So it's actually, you know, it's more of a, you know, no frills. It's just straight to the point, yep. you know. It's, the walls are blacked out, so we get it in as much as we can. Yep. You know what's cool, what's, what's different now, and I think where a guy like you is really heralding in this next evolution of fitness where you have the general pop, the civilians, if you will, regular people, hardworking people with jobs and families and school and things like that, they're mm -hmm. not fighting professionally. They're not going to the Olympics this year, but they're working just as hard and have their own challenges and goals. They're yeah. now seeking out world-class coaches like yourself to yeah. get it in, to get in shape, to push. They're not yeah. going to the little, no disrespect, but to the general clipboard holder at the local global fitness and doing yeah. your 30 minute, you know, three sets of 10 type workout. That's yeah. new. That mm -hmm. five years ago, regular people don't have access to a coach like yourself to just walk into your facility yeah. and be trained. So what do you see as, as far as your experience now? Because I think the big part of the audience is, is that person. People that li that listen to us love us, you know, love love the sport, love the shit, but they're out there working. Yeah. Well, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, it, it all comes down to dedication. It all comes down to how bad you actually want it and what you want to accomplish. You know, figuring out your own goals and figuring out what you need to do to set those goals and and honestly stay on point. It all comes down to dedication and also having the um, you know the determination to get up and get things done. I get up every day at 4 a.m. So I can get a lot of my own things done, you know, and, you know, Mike, man, like all the time, somebody wants something or needs something from you. So at that time, nobody's up. So I get to do whatever I need to do for myself. And there's no, you know, coach, I need this coach. I need that. I can do what I need to do. So my, my advice would be to stay dedicated and stay determined in that perspective and make sure that you set up a schedule so you know when you have time to actually do it for yourself. And, and usually I, I try to implement that with the general public here. So what's your average day look like? You're up at 4 a.m., then what happens? So I get up at like 4, um, have my coffee, and I'll check my emails, I'll check my DMs. Then from there, I'll hit the gym, I'll do my cardio, I'll do about 30 to 45 minutes of conditioning. Then I'll come home, I'll get a little bit of breakfast in, I'll go back to the gym. I'll get some weight training in. So by the time 7 o'clock, 7.30 comes around, I can take my son to school and uh, say goodbye to everybody. And then 
usually I'm on my way to American Top Team where I drive about 90 minutes down south. I'll probably train maybe from about 10 a.m. to about 8 to 9 p.m. with groups all day there. And that's Monday, Tuesday, Thursdays, and Fridays. On Wednesdays, I usually do the same thing in the morning, but then I come back here and I'll probably get some work in. And then obviously we do a lot of videos. So we do some videos for YouTube and then also just studying and, and you know doing podcasts and things like this. Yeah, and your YouTube channel, that's starting to blow up. You're putting a lot of really good content out there. People are finding it, which is cool. Yeah, yeah, man. We're, we're trying to pump out as much volume as possible. You know, we're trying to give people as much valued content as we can. Yep. You know, something that's actually going to be able to take with a person to increase their abilities to perform. A lot of the stuff I do does more is predicated more towards combat sports, but the average person can can actually watch it and learn from it, too, as well. I talk about, you know, conditioning. I talk about mobilization, mobility work. I talk about strength strength in general. I do a lot of things when it comes down to the science, but also have the practical application so that people can actually utilize these things, but know that it's not just coming from, like, a bro science approach. Yeah, and that's another thing that sets you apart is your background. You actually have an academic background along with a, a D1 athletic career yourself as a D1 football player as a mixed martial artist, as a power lifter, as a bodybuilder, that's a yeah. lot. That's a lot of hats. That's a lot of lenses. As, as Dr. Bo Hightower says, he says, we as coaches, the better coaches are able to see the individual athlete from a multitude of lenses, not just their one skill set. So the more lenses yeah. you have, the more capable you are, the more experienced. Yeah, I mean, I think that doing all these sports and uh, was able to compete at a level – at a high enough level, I can actually feel what it needs, what you need at a certain you know, particular time. And for an athlete, I can correlate all these sports and put them together so that we can properly program and that I know how these things feel on an individual, on the central nervous system, and how well they need to recover from these certain types of methodologies or modalities. Yeah. So, yeah, I think that that and then also fighting, you know, and you know, Mike, man, it's like with, with me being an ex-pro fighter, with the fight game now, while I'm coaching, it creates a large level of respect and trust and buy-in with my athletes because they know that I know what they're going through, right? They trust in me because I've been in their shoes before. So it does resonate. Um, I tell a lot of my interns, you know, you don't have to obviously fight, but you need to get into the sport and you need to learn how it feels to get in a guillotine. You need to learn how it feels to be dead tired when you're wrestling and you don't have any more breath in you, but you still got to push past that pace. Yep. Then you also have to feel it from a fatigue standpoint and then also a recovery standpoint. Yep. Putting yourself in that position, in that type of mind frame, will help you and enhance your abilities to coach these types of individuals. And that goes from any any you know spectrum of life. Yep. It's funny that you, you, you use wrestling as the analogy and you get to that point. And unless you've actually wrestled, you yep. don't understand this. But to, to get to that point, I don't know, 15 to 40 minutes into a wrestling practice, which is all hell every minute, get yeah. to that point that you're going fucking live goes over and over, and you, however it, it is, drilling even, or just fucking live goes, takedown ladders, let's say. Yeah. You hit that point. Definitely. You, you're, you're broken. You're physically broken, and I say you're, you're at that point of mentally breaking where you have that yeah. conversation with yourself. Yeah. And, you know, it, it's funny. So I remember as you're talking, last time I felt that was years ago at American Top Team mm. with Gleason T Bell on a Monday, a Monday wrestling practice. And you know how the fuck that goes, man? Non stop, yeah. <laughs> non just takedowns, takedowns, takedowns. And T Bell and I, we just happened to be able to pair it up. And he's a fucking fucker, right? Yeah. <laughs> he's a fucking stud, man. He's a fucking stud. He goes. Uh, oh, so we both, I remember, we both like hands on our knees and go. I think Kami was screaming, you know, fucking yeah. go. And we just stare at each other and like take that big deep breath. It's like fuck. And then you know he comes at you like a fucking horse. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. You know, and that's wrestling though. And hopefully, uh, I I didn't do terribly also in that exchange, able to go out there and dig deep and go yeah. for another fifteen fucking minutes. Yeah. Go live, yeah. you know, go real, go live. So it's funny that you say that you've been there. Yeah. I mean, you really get to test yourself mentally more than. More, I mean, physically, yes, of course, physiologically, but also the mental side of it plays a big role, man. And, and 
learning that and understanding that, man, you will callous the brain in so many ways. You know, I just finished reading a book by David Goggins, yeah. and um, and it's so true, man. It's like putting yourself in those uncomfortable situations to almost callous your mind to where, like, nothing really can bother you. Yep. You know, with that being said, I think that these guys, especially my wrestlers that come from a, a division one background, the highest level that you can be in, you know, they come from, you know, dragged out, you know, wrestling sessions on a daily basis. So you're like, man, there's nothing really that, that can bother them yep. from a mental standpoint. Now, obviously, there's things that I can do to get them tired, but that's with every strength coach. At the end of the day, that's not my job. I'm not really trying to get them exhausted or anything like that. I know they have that ability, especially with the athletes I have. I know they have that ability to withstand that 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 trouble because they're at a high level and they've been there. Now, but when you're talking about high school athletes, when you're talking about young kids and, and they haven't really been put through it as much, you really start to test them when it comes to that. And then it, you start to see exactly what type of person are they? You know, are they prey or predator? And at the end of the day, we want to make sure that we have the ability to either – transform them or give them the mindset to, so that they can be successful not only in sports but in life yeah. and that in and, and those sports like wrestling do that yeah absolutely and that the the grind of it the push of it the ability to push until the athlete has that ability to push the physiology of it doesn't really matter as much because they're not pushing to the level that the yeah. physiology starts to separate the champions yeah. from the other mentally strong one percent you know of the population that can and it's yeah. like you said at high school is a great time where that's very formative it's learned during those early mid teenage years mm -hmm. of what it's like because you're now you have the feeling of an adult's body you know yeah. you can push and you understand consequence now also it's not just your little jimmy the the eighth grade wrestling champion that's more yeah. your parents will than your own will Mid high school, it kicks in, and I think that's a great time to grab athletes. Oh you yeah, get an athlete and shape them during those two or three years, you know, kind of in, in the middle, that they can pop at the top. Yeah, I think that 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 right there is a good age to start to really understand a person, you know, and they're they're coming into their own. They're understanding what they need to do to be successful from that perspective, and they know that what they do from here on out will dictate their future. Yep. So teaching them the right tools and give or giving them the right tools and teaching them the right mindset to be in, um, that's going to resonate with them. And as a coach, you're a leader, you know, you're a mentor. I have to make sure that I'm there for these kids just as much as if their parents were, yeah. because they're going to look up to me just as much, if not more, because I'm something of them that they look, look to upon to help them get out of a situation or get out of a hole. Right. When they're when they're, you know, lifting weights and they're dead tired or they're running on the field and they're dead tired. I'm the one that needs to be there to help them out. And for that, I need to make sure that they, they put I put the right mindset in them so that it can carry on in the future. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. And that's what being a coach is about, man. That's it. Yep. Without that, you're not a coach. You just know shit. Yep. Big for difference. Sure. You know, and sure. there's a lot of people that know shit. Right. Mm -hmm. But they're shitty fucking coaches. They just can't convey it they don't care enough or they can't connect they can't deliver the message so then everybody's time is wasted um now yeah. as coaching so you coach world-class athletes also right that that's a big part of it you, you coach, coach the cream of the crop um joanna jerjacek dustin pori andre narlovsky uh tisha torres junior dos santos king mo amanda nunez i say that because that's a kim picture those athletes right now but, you know, picture those fucking athletes i mean picture tisha standing next to jds yeah <laughs> right and you yeah. have to go and program for these two athletes tisha's not doing the same shit jds is doing and and yeah. vice versa right all across the board but yeah the programs the, the the principles are the same right yeah so i mean and we talked about this you were at the seminar and um you know the fight science institute seminar and what i usually state is that you know the systems may remain the same but the execution is subjective right i can have you know junior in the same group as Tisha, and they may be doing the same type of uh, same type of movement, maybe same type of even exercise, but the volume, the intensities may change. Um, you know, whether whether they're in a certain time in camp, things may change. They one may be eight weeks out, one may be two weeks out. They can still train in the same you know same time frame in the same weight room. They just need we just need to make sure that we know exactly what they need at that particular time. 
And we also need to know the athlete and what they need individually. But it all comes down to having a system and a set based of principles so that you can rely upon going further. Yeah. The only thing that, that the one thing that I see with coaches is that they have a blanketed approach where they think that one size fits all. And that's definitely not the case when you're talking about mixed martial arts athletes and any athlete in general. Everything is subjective. Everybody needs a particular thing at one point in time because we all are individuals. Yeah. So that all comes down to the assessment, right? In the in the beginning of the camp or, you know, down the line when you're when you're starting up your camp, I like to do a baseline assessment with all my athletes about nine to ten weeks out because eight weeks out we do start to uh, start camp. Sure. So once I get that, I get a, a basically a knowledge base to understand what exactly they need, whether that be from a physiological standpoint, a structural standpoint, you know, what type of coach do they actually like now with like Dustin and Tisha, you know, I've known them for four or five years now. So it's pretty easy for me to understand them. But if I have a new fighter come in, I need to know exactly what and how I need to coach them. And I need to know exactly how they like to be coached um, because that's going to give me an overall an overall base of, of knowledge to understand what I need to do from a from an art of coaching standpoint, not just from the science base, because that's one side that people miss is they don't know how to communicate with their athletes. So my whole thing is making sure that I have proper communication and, um, and I'm doing the right things at the right times for that individual. Yeah. And communication is lost a lot between the athlete and the coach, I think, because a lot of coaches, they'll just create templates, essentially, and the athlete likes to follow a template. They want to shut their brain off in many ways. You get a few athletes that ask a lot of questions, which is good, um, partially good. But, yeah. you know, <laughs> so you see, without the athlete communicating, then they're six weeks in and they're like, yeah, dude, like my shoulder's been hurting for the last six weeks or I don't feel that exercise at all or just whatever the, the conversation is or they're just, you know, they're unhappy with their where they've progressed because it's yeah. not in where they want to go. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, and, and that's, a, that's a part that's missed also. Yeah, that's that's one of the reasons why we like to give them a questionnaire and, and actually see exactly what what works, what doesn't work. And then it's always it's always a, an evaluation process. You know, every day they come in, we still assess, you know, we assess we assess the movements yep. because they're going to be there's going to be bumps and bruises. They're going to get hurt. You know, they're, they're, it's a contact sport, you know, and I can't tell you a time when somebody comes into the gym and they're 100 yeah. percent, mainly I want to say 99.9 .9 percent of the time. There's always something going on. Yeah. always something right so i have to have the the correct means to call an audible and auto regulate on the spot no matter what now i may have something planned don't get me wrong I, there's always going to be a plan if you don't have a plan you plan to fail but i always have to make sure that i have a plan b so that i can auto regulate and call an audible if necessary so that we can keep progressions going because yep. if not then you're going to be you know sitting there with with your thumb stuck up your ass wondering what do i need to do now Yep. So you need to make sure that you have the ability to change things up on the fly. If you're if you're training any type of athlete in a large setting, especially in a sport like mixed martial arts or any combat sport. Yeah. I like it, man. With your what's your governing training philosophy? Just, you know, a bar conversation. I mean, when it comes to philosophies, you know, like what are you trying it's to funny, do? Man. What's that? I said, what, like, what are you what are you trying to do with these athletes? What, what's 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 the well, style? You know, when it comes to these, I mean, they're high level, right? And a lot of my guys and girls have been fighting forever. When it comes to them, you know, my, my main focus is to make sure that we're reducing the risk of injury because we need to keep them on the mats. We need to keep them training their skills, um, and then I want to increase their athletic ability ability through speed, power, strength, mobility, um, giving them longevity in the sport. So if I can make them a better overall athlete, a better mover, right, increase their overall conditioning, and then also make sure that they have that longevity through training the proper ways and then also making sure we're managing fatigue, that's the primary focus of my whole training philosophy. And when you train, you're more, we spoke about this briefly at the Fight Science Institute weekend, that you're an absolute strength guy and there's yeah. oh, there's other coaches and you know we probably won't get into that on this one that mm -hmm. don't follow that they, they train more very specialized strength um, mm -hmm. as the governing philosophy not that you know you improve specialized strengths of course mm -hmm. this is now me over talking um 
talk about that a little bit. What is absolute strength and, and how does that fit into what the average person should be doing? Every person should be doing. Well, I mean, absolute strength is the ability to produce force maximally. Now, when it comes down to special strengths, we, we utilize special strength exercises to increase the ability to produce force maximally. Yeah. Right. So when there's a breakdown in a movement pattern, I'm going to take a special exercise so that we can create the optimal amount of force production in any type of, uh, of movement in general. Yeah. When you're talking about a, a fighter, right, they're not weightlifters, they're not powerlifters, right? We want to make sure that they're strong for their sport. Now, when you increase force production, you're going to increase relative strength. When you increase that relative strength off of their one rep max, now stick with me here, their conditioning will go up. The reason why is because you just increase their energy efficiency, right? If they're a 185 pound fighter and they fight a guy that's 185 and their max deadlift is up in the, let's say 225, let's say real light. If they pick up a guy that's 185, they probably don't have a whole lot left in the tank, right? Because it's near close to their max. Now, if they take that one rep max and they increase that by, a, by double, let's say 400, 450. Now they go and lift up that 185 pound guy, right, with double underhooks. It's a whole lot easier from an energy efficiency standpoint so that they can sustain that energy throughout the entire fight. With that being said, I'm going to take base, very efficient movement patterns, something that they can do. I'm not going to put, you know, a load on a fighter that doesn't have the capacity to withstand that load or cannot move in that particular frame. We need to make sure that we're giving them the proper exercises with the highest correspondence to the sport, but also making sure that they can do it very efficiently so that it can be effective to get an adaptation. Yeah. So that's why I use a lot of like Zercher squats, you know, sumo deadlifts, things like that, because I know that's going to have very efficient uh, ways of doing it. And we still get the stimulus response through a squat pattern. Yep. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I love it. I love it. Yeah. It made sense to me. Yeah, I mean, a lot of my guys and girls and what I've seen in the past is that, you know, we have and I look at and I look at common occurrences. Now, everybody is subjective. Don't get me wrong. But for the most part, working with over 65 fighters on a weekly basis, I do see weak lower backs, you know, or I should say this. I say I retract that. I see strong lower backs. I see weak hips. And the reason why is because they lack mobility. And when you lack mobility, you lack that control in, in ranges. You're not able to contract the muscles needed because they're tight. So what will we do? We need to get the hips stronger so you do not compensate through the low back. This way you can eliminate any injury. You can reduce the risk of any non-contact tears, right? Especially inside the joint or inside the, the tissue itself. And we're increasing force production in the entire body so that the body can withstand load and reabsorb force. So we do things like sumo deadlifts, um, when it comes down to pressing, I like to do floor pressing. I like to do incline pressing. Um, anything that's going to have, again, the, the highest correspondence to the sport, but also making sure that we're not putting the body at risk, you know, putting them under load without the proper prerequisites, proper prerequisites to get underneath load. What's the that? Doing, they're, doing, they're doing long press over here. Let's My see. bad. Sorry about that. No, it's <laughs> it's perfect. It actually it suits the uh, the conversation very well, actually. Be weird if you were sitting in a coffee shop with a Nirvana in the background. <laughs> um, that was, so I forgot what I was going to say from that point. Um, now overhead, that's what I was going to say. Overhead pressing. Do you do over over? Do you do any overhead pressing with your fighters? And if so, what type do you see or feel is most efficient? Okay, so with overhead pressing, they, they again we go back to having the prerequisites to do so, right? So that goes back to the assessment. If they cannot properly get into shoulder flexion without load, I'm not going to load that pattern, yep. right? You're going to hurt them. So at the end of the day, primarily what I see is lack of external rotation and lack of shoulder flexion yep. because they are kyphotic in nature due to the sport. Tight lats, tight anterior delt, tight pec minor, which causes that kyphotic rolled over posture. Yep. So we will increase the range of motion inside that joint capsule so that in time yes we can do those vertical overhead presses yeah. but for now we will regress and go to the floor we'll do horizontal presses things like that now can you get them stronger without 
vertical pressing? Yes, of course. That, that doesn't make any sense, right? Um, what we can do, though, is to give them a better overall structure of body, we want to make sure that we're increasing range of motion in each joint capsule throughout the kinetic chain. And then, but we do not stall on our training as far as strength and power and speed and things like that. We just do it in a different way that's efficient and effective for the athlete. Yep. As long as they have the prerequisites to do a movement, we can do it. But it comes from the assessment first. Yep. Um, I had Stan Everything on uh, a little while back. You were talking about strength stuff and, and philosophy. And he basically, and I'll, I'll paraphrase because, you know, he, he probably did about eight minutes on it. Um, mm -hmm. That it's all about, it's just loading the spine. At the mm -hmm. end of the day, that at the top level, that's really what it comes down to. It's just loading the spine, re repetitively loading the, the, the spine uh, with volume and or intensity. You, yep. you know, that, that basically what it is. And that, that's a very simplistic but basic, which is perfect form of it, right? So yep. you see a lot of these, you know, very isolated exercises being performed in the gym for, you know, 15, 45 minutes, what have you, where that yeah. would have been much better. The entire session would have been much better with, you know, 10% of that time of just loading the spine at high intensity and walking out and going home. You can oh, do yeah. a little bit more for sure, but that, mm -hmm. that's the, the crux of it, right? Oh, yeah, definitely. You know, and, 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 and in, in the case of loading the spine and axial loading in, in general, you know, whenever I load the spine, I want to decompress the spine because they're, they are getting beat up on a constant basis. So we do things like reverse hypers. Yeah. We do things like hanging leg raises and, and, and uh, GHRs and things like that to help decompress the, the spine, get some traction in there so that you can keep the spine healthy, yeah. right? Primarily, a lot of low back injuries you see yeah. due to the fact, listen, I power lift. I know how it feels to have a tight low back, you know, what we don't want to do is we don't want to repetitively load the spine without giving it some decompression so that you can have more longevity in the sport and then also making sure that we're getting it stronger, but also from every range of motion. Yep. Um, I got teeter hangups. You know what those are, those inversion boots? Yep, yep, yep. Um, when I first, awesome. got, first got them, I was like a fucking idiot. Yep. If I could hang for five minutes, I should probably try and do it for ten minutes. And then, you know... Fucking after a while of doing it, because at first it feels great at first when you get used to the yeah. the blood rush, it feels great. Uh, yeah. And I would only do it with someone else in the facility, right? Because I'm not gonna fucking pass out and be stuck upside down like a yeah. dead vampire, right? Um. Anyway, so I did it, and I fucking I was getting to the point that I, it was creating damage. I was I was pulling my fucking hips out, right? Pulling my lumbar out, yeah. um, yeah. and I had to give it a little bit of time off. And now when I go up, I'll go up for like three to five minutes. Um, yep. you know, a day, every other day or so, I got the hyper here, reverse hyper leg raises, weighted leg raises, what have you, uh, um, oh, yeah. some band work, prone band work with bands, just, you know, pulling on the hips, pulling on the ankles, pulling inwards, upwards, um, mm -hmm. you know, and that's all the, I don't want to say easy shit, but five, it, like five minutes, eight minutes a day. If you really want to yeah. be efficient about it, get your shit together, um, mm -hmm. that people skip and it's, mm -hmm. those are the times, those are the issues that, People are full of shit. They want to be there. They want to achieve. They want to be special. They want to, you know, get something done. But like I talk about the goal setting, they won't take five fucking minutes to write a goal down with a crayon in the yeah. morning, right? But they want to go and, and be a millionaire and, and, and you whatever, get the, yeah. the pretty girl or whatever. Um, if habits for efficiency outside of the gym, outside of the training, what do you see as being mandatory, necessary for just life success? Yeah, I mean, primarily nothing will work for me unless I have a schedule. I have to make sure that I have a proper plan in place again. Yep. You know, so it's scheduling out my day ahead of time is key for me, man. And also having a solid team around you, right? Yeah. If I don't have a team, if I try to do all this shit that I do on my own, it's not going to work, right? And I make sure I delegate my the things that I'm not good at. I make sure I delegate that to the people that I know can handle that stuff, yep. you know? And honestly, I know what I'm good at, right? I'm also going to make sure that I'm taking care of my weaknesses. Don't get me wrong, but I don't want to, I don't want to waste too much time and energy on something that I know that I can delegate to because it's more efficient to get what I can get done yep. and then make sure that my team can handle the rest. But definitely scheduling out your time ahead of time is, is key for me. Yeah. And a lot of people feel and say in conversation that it's, it's too hard to schedule. Like they're, they're too busy. Like they're too busy 
they can't schedule. They're so busy they can't schedule, not realizing if they had a schedule, they wouldn't be nearly as, as busy. They'd find so much efficiency in what they could yeah. accomplish in their day. They'd get more done. You get more done than the average person, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, at least I, I think so <laughs> for the most part. You know, uh, I'm pretty much getting half of the stuff that I, you know, that I need done by 9 o'clock, yeah. you know, That's 9 a.m. So, I mean, with that being said, I got the whole day to do extra amount of activities that just progress me even further and take me that further along down success, you know. So, my whole thing is I like to make sure that I'm giving, I'm giving the ample amount of time within the first half of my day. Yep. to get what I need to get done that's truly important. And then the rest is, is just, you know, that's overtime work, yep. you know. And, and honestly, I'm an, I'm an overachiever, so I like to work overtime anyways. Yep. I'm good to go, you know. But like I said, man, it, it really it really is, it comes down to that is being dedicated every day and, and really, you know, um, structuring out your day as much as you possibly can because there's going to be times throughout the day where, you think you don't have time, but you really do if you put it in proper place. Because there is a lot of shit throwing out the day that people think that they are busy, but they're really not, yeah. right? And um, and if you audit your life like that, you'll truly see that you have a little bit more time than you thought you had. Yeah, um, I'm very similar. If it, if it if it's scheduled, I can get anything. I can get a year's worth of work done in a day if yeah. it's if it's scheduled and I'm running tight, right? And everybody that has to i have to communicate with has their shit together if you're dealing with with pros right yeah. um what i try and do and what works best for me is is everything's on the 15. every 15 minutes is how i stack my day so i'm either on the call for 15 minutes or 30 or 45 or 60. but it's not just like hey give me a call at one it's like no motherfucker mm -hmm. like one to 115 boom i got you 130 to whatever whatever i got this and I do, right. I call them gray areas in between those blocks. I, I put a gray area in. And this isn't mm -hmm. always written and hard scripted. Some of it's kind of general, but the appointments are hard scripted on top of my own wake up time and dinner, breakfast with the kids time and those other set times. You know, I have to write those down. I like so it. Then you have that gray area that allows for a little bit of flood over if you needed it or mm -hmm. prep for whatever else you have to do or just a quick meal or stare at the ceiling for mm -hmm. eight minutes in between kind of the next thing. Um, yeah. And planning for that, the gray area, as I call it, allows me to be much more efficient and prepared and on time and thorough gotcha. and researched as I continue to go through that. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I like that, actually, you know. And that, that goes back to, like, making sure that you're keeping, you know, a structured time frame, but, but also making sure that every moment of your day is accounted for yep. even like even when you say like staring at the ceiling like sometimes you need that shit you have to sometimes i need to just decompress yep. and turn some shit off yep. and try to meditate and just let it go yep you know um and that and that's something that can be jotted down in, in, as part of the schedule absolutely you know? i for usually sure. i have mine set for and this one isn't hard set it's kind of based upon the need and the output um mm -hmm. in the morning you know or late morning or so usually it's somewhere between like 10 if it's a crazy day or 11 or so kind of you know before like a little lunch time uh, and then yeah. a little bit later on at night before i go home to the family i'm kind of winding down i got done like the the content push or whatever that is that kind of being on aspect um, yeah and for me it, it's laying on my back usually feet up you know laying on my back you know um feet on a chair or something like that staring at the ceilings arms wide and uh just zone float away for a few minutes and it's especially dealing with as many humans as you do because it's the emotional right the emotional drain and the connectivity and the better you yeah. are the more draining it is you have to go and charge recharge those batteries yeah yeah that's that is you hit that right on the head man it's it's i see a lot of different individuals on a daily basis man yeah. like i deal with a lot of different types of people and um and personality types and you got to know how to manage that in a way and also communicate to different types of people on a daily basis for me yep. you know um even walking into american top team i'm already meeting and greeting about 40 40 to 50 people as soon as i walk in the door yeah so i mean with that sometimes it does get a little draining don't get me wrong yeah and i'm human you know sometimes i do need a break man i need to get away i need time for myself and and honestly those drives to american top team those 90 minute drives that's kind of my time where I can just take it to my, you know, just take it upon myself to just relax 
and you know, be in my own head a little bit more, yeah. you know. Um, and it, and it gives me a lot of time to self reflect. It gives me a lot of time to you know self um, self educate myself, you know, with with podcasts and 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 audio books and things like that. Yeah. Um, I get a lot done on that damn drive. Matter of fact, shit. Yeah. Now I think about it, you know. But I mean, it, with that being said, that's another thing is I'm using my time wisely throughout the days. Yeah. I could have just been, I could put on the radio and listen to music and nonsense shit, but I use it to get better. I use that time of that drive to get better, you know? And I think that that's helped me a lot when we're talking about, you know, increasing my level of success throughout my coaching ability and throughout just life in general, man. I learned a ton of shit for driving and listening to other people and their circumstances and their situations and then learning from that. Um, man, it's been, it's been, uh, it's, it's like a, it's like a, a gift and a curse, man. You know, cause driving does fuck up my knees. It, it messes up my hips sure. and sometimes, you know, but, uh, and even with plane rides, you know how it is, man, you, you traveled and you know how it goes. It's like, but I use that plane ride to get work done. Yeah. You know, I'm not, I'm not there, you know, watching movies. I'm, I'm, I'm actually getting work done. And I do a lot of trips overseas around the world. I, I mean, I've, I've done 30 hour plane rides before. Yeah. To Australia and Singapore, and I get a ton of fucking work done because that's just me, though. Yeah. You know, that's I don't like to rest. I like to make sure that I'm productive in every stretch of the imagination throughout the entire fucking day. Yep. You know, there's I, recently I don't know where whether it's a Instagram or a documentary or whatever I saw, but mm -hmm. on on average, in general, the most successful people have that capacity or not even a capacity it's a yearning whether they like it or not they're always trying to improve something about themselves or their life or their skill set or their proximity their knowledge base their network they're always yeah. trying to better themselves and it, for some it's it can be a, a sickness in a way because it becomes yeah. so controlling you miss out on interpersonal relationships and, and other aspects of life you know kind of smelling the roses and unsuccessful people still good people they don't. They're with that free time, that extra 90 minutes, you're just like, I'm going to learn more about, you know, whatever it is, you know, something that's going to push yeah. your business, your life, your, your your education forward. And they're in many ways looking for, man, I can't wait till Friday to get fucked up with my friends and forget about this shit for a while. Uh, yeah. You know, and, and that's what it is. And they work hard their Monday through Friday and Friday they just shut it off and they fucking, yeah. you know, do what they got to do. Man, I'm going to tell you, honest truth, man, I, I really don't even look at Fridays like Fridays. You know what I mean? Like the end of the week anymore, Friday's you know? Monday. And um, honestly, I work all the way through. Sundays, I don't even know the days sometimes. You know, only only way I know the days is that, you know, if I'm staying up here or I'm going down there. That's the only time I know. Yeah. Sundays, I try to make sure, and I do make sure that it's more of a family day. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. Um, but I do make sure that I'm, I'm, I'm reading and I'm, and I'm either when it, when it, whether it be, you know, reading a book that I'm reading or, you know, articles or researching, things like that, just to make sure that I'm one step ahead of the game and to make sure that I'm ready for the week ahead. Yep. So my planning is very big on Sundays. My scheduling is very big. Whatever, you know, is the plan of action that week, I want to make sure that that Sunday, I make sure that I, uh, I hammer it down on that too as well. Yeah. You know? and we, we use the term just like you, that, that, Sunday is Monday. Friday yeah. is Monday. It's all fucking Monday. Every day is Monday, yeah. right? Every day is Monday. And on the Saturdays and the Sundays, family time is that's always the key. That's why you do it, right? That's yeah. that's, that's why, you know, you you make the 90 minute drive. It's nice to work with the athletes, but you're building yeah. a life for yourself and for your family and, and a business for yourself and all the things yeah. that come with that. And there's a Fresh sacrifice course. to that. So on Sunday, the dedicated family day or so, you, you know, you're, you're there, you're present. I'm speaking, you know, kind of for you, um, mm -hmm. but it never shuts off the entrepreneurial aspect, the business aspect, the coaching aspect, that sickness in a way is yeah. still pushing you forward and you channel it into the, the positive of improvement. Yeah. But anyone yeah. who, who ha wants to have any success on that Monday, if they mm -hmm. don't pause on Sunday and, and, and start to do that. There's, there, you said they're failing or they're they're planning to fail because they, they, they have yeah. no plan come when they wake up Monday morning. They have no groceries. They don't yeah. know what they're training tomorrow night. They don't know why they're going to the gym even. Fuck. 
Like, yeah, yeah. You know, but they're going to go at six o'clock. I don't know. I'll probably do the treadmill or something. <laughs> yeah, pretty you much. Know? Man. Yeah. Right? Walk around aimlessly. Yeah. Going, going to every machine possible. Yeah. yeah I know it, man. And I know it. In the beginning, that's good. Yeah. Uh, you're there. Yeah, you, cool. I mean, you got to start somewhere. I get it. Cool. But again, once you start to develop, okay, now I need to know. Now I know what I need. Yeah. Now it's time to set a baseline, right? And then we can start to grow from that base, you know? So. And that's that's in everything, not just the gym. The great thing about the gym and the and in, in, in the weights in general and any type of fitness orientated sport or or activity yeah. is it really tests you, but it also gives you structure for your entire life. Yeah. Right? You have to make sure that you're there. You have to be there kinda on time because if you're not, then you're probably gonna be late to work. Yeah. Right? You gotta make sure that you have enough time to get it done so time efficiency is there, yeah. right? You have to make sure that you're organized to know your sets, your reps, your exercise selection, right? You need to know the intensity and volume, so you need to know how hard you can go and how long you can sustain that, yeah. right? And then you also need to make sure that you're getting adequate recovery and rest. Yeah. Now, that can be active rest or that can be passive rest. We need both, and that's the same thing in life. We need, sometimes we do need a vacation, I hate that word, but we do need that, yeah. right? For the simple fact to recharge and get back to it even harder. Now, I may be saying this out of turn because it's more of like, you know, do as I say, not as I do, because I really don't take vacations. Yeah. But the vacations that I do take, it's primarily based off my family and making sure that they're getting my time, yeah. right? With that being said, yeah, I mean, rest and recovery is obviously key, yeah. right? But you rest enough to make sure you can go harder on every every aspect of life and throughout the days and throughout the weeks and months and years and things like that. Yep. Yeah. I love it. Now, to change it up a little bit, one name. Who can beat John Jones? Okay, so you're going to think – you think I'm crazy name. on this one. I know All you're right? crazy. I hung out with you. You're fucking crazy. Go. <laughs> but I truly think, I truly think DC, if he gets another shot, okay. I think DC can take it. Yep. And the reason why I'm saying this is because DC felt it twice. Yep. He knows John better than anybody. Yep. You know? And on that same fact, I don't think John really takes him seriously anymore. Yeah. I think John thinks he has his number. It's over. Yeah. So with that being said, I think DC holds the key. Now, who knows if he goes up to heavyweight. I think Junior can take him. If he wants to try Junior out, let's make it happen. That'd be fun to watch, actually. I'm, I'm down for that because I know Junior can match him for his speed. Yeah. I think he's way faster than John, honestly. Wow. He's and that obviously, fast, huh? Oh, man, bro. Yeah. You have no idea. Yeah. This, guy, this guy moves around like a, a at least a middleweight. Yep. You know, with his movement, with his speed, with his power, yep. and with his power endurance. Yeah. So with that, I think that he does, man, he can definitely put Jones away. Yep. It's just, you know, is he really going to take that fight against a guy that's that big, that that's, that, 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 you know, that powerful? Man. And it's been in the game for a while now. You know, he's seen everything. Depends so. on his legacy. You remember Anderson started moving around a lot? You know, after yeah. he got kind of bored of being so dominant, he started to move. Up, you know, had some scary fights even. Um, yeah, it makes sense. It makes sense. John could, but that'd be a good one. That'd be fun to watch. Um, yeah, for sure. What else do we got? Is uh, McGregor retired? Question everybody wants to hey, know. Hey, listen, man. Honestly, I hope he does retire. You know, you get you get, you get get $100 million, man. I don't think getting punched in the face is that much fun anyways. Yeah. You know, um, with that being said, you know, he, he wants to do it for legacy. Who knows? Yeah. Um, but if he does come back, I think I got a guy by the name of Dustin Poirier will welcome him back with open arms, you, you know, and maybe a fist to the face because he owes him that, you know. But uh, other than that, man, I think we're good. You know, I, I honestly, I think Connor, in, in all actuality, Connor's a good guy, man. I, I, I know guys that work with him and, and, and things like that. But I, I think Connor, from a health perspective, from a legacy perspective, and then just, you know, in general, from a fighter and me being a former fighter. I kind of like the, the move if he does retire, you know, and if he wants to go out on top and with a win, so be it. I understand that completely. But, um, you know, what really do you have to prove? I mean, 
I know that he he lost to Khabib, he lost to Nate. You know, um, there's things there, but Khabib's like one of the best fighters in the world, man. Yeah. You know, and Nate's arguably one of the better fighters in the world. You know what I mean? So you didn't lose to to quote unquote scrubs. You lost to very very good fighters. Yeah. You know, nobody can really take him take that away from him. No, I agree, and and I love it that yeah, he should stay fucking retired. I'm not telling him to. I'm not saying that he. he Needs to, but he fucking should. Why wouldn't he? And I, I agree. His legacy is intact, man. People oh, talk yeah. shit about Conor McGregor for because they're fucking haters. You know, yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't yeah. work with the dude, but that dude deserves his fucking respect because he starched fucking Aldo. He beat up yeah. Mendez and had to overcome adversity to fucking pull out a win versus Mendez on short oh, yeah. notice. Mendez is a fucking beast, man. The kid's always yeah. in the gym, always training. Um, the wars with Nate. Nate's a big dude, man. He's I know, a big I know. fucking dude and tough as fuck. You know that, yeah. that's no fucking slouch. It's a big dude who knows how to fight. Um, yeah, with the gas tank. With the, with gas, the gas tank. tank. And yeah. fucking Connor went fifty minutes with that, or not? Did, no, because he got tapped out right in that one. But still, he went what the fucking one, yeah. forty, yeah. forty-five minutes with fucking Nate. Yeah. Um, Al- Alvarez. You know, fucking yep. Eddie Alvarez. Fucking put him down. Are you kidding me? He made he made Eddie Alvarez look like a, a child. Yup. And you Eddie's. Know, so. Eddie's still top of the food chain. Eddie will probably go yeah. in there and fucking win and yeah, one and hold it for a while. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Right? Yeah. Um, plus, Connor's got all that fucking money. <laughs> all that money, baby. Fuck you. Yeah, okay. Right? He doesn't need to fight yeah. anymore. Um, nah. But, it's like, not. health-wise. Why, man? He's done it. He's had his 20, 30-some-odd fights. He's made, you know, God knows. I hope he makes a half a billion dollars or however much. Oh, yeah. I love to see that shit. Why yeah, the fuck yeah. come back, man? He'll, he'll he'll leverage he'll leverage that you know to, you know with with the you know with the uh, the whiskey company and all this other shit, man. He'll he'll definitely he'll leverage all of that. He's he's a smart guy. So with that being said, you got to utilize your strengths, man. And, and honestly, he could go and do movies and all this other shit and still be just as successful, if not more. Yep. You know. So and he doesn't have to get punched in the face to do it. You know. Picture this. This is it. I'm calling it right now. Notorious management. Picture <laughs> that, that motherfucker as a manager of fighters. I see that happening. Right. I see that happening. I mean, I mean, Floyd tried to do it. I mean, I don't think he's doing a great job of it, but you know, Floyd's a different character. Floyd's you know? selfish, but, um, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, I think, I think um, Connor is a different type of person, man. You know, he's not, he's not that selfish. He's not selfish at all, in my opinion. You know, selfless. To that degree, I mean, you have to be a little selfish. Don't get me wrong, to be a fighter, you yeah. know that. Yeah. But um, of course. But when it comes to his team and when it comes to like helping people, I don't see him being like that. I think that he'd be a great manager. Especially if he's getting twenty percent of whatever he's making them. Yeah. Twenty yeah. percent of seven figures, you know, times yeah. forty, fifty, a hundred athletes. For sure, man. That's yeah. not a bad fucking haul. A couple times a year, right? Yeah, not bad at all, man. I'll do it. I'll sign me up. Fuck it. Fuck <laughs> it. Sign me up, man. Um, so what do you – I know you're busy, man. I know we had that quick trip in, in New York. I know you had to get back. I mean, you brought an athlete with you, or the athlete came with you out there to yeah. make sure she didn't miss her training sessions. Um, yeah. You had to hop right back with more athletes on the fucking grind, man. So what, what's next? What do you guys got? Oh, uh, well, I have Edson Barbosa fighting in Philadelphia. Right. He's got Justin Gagey this weekend. Um, next weekend, I think – is it next weekend or the weekend after that? Two weeks from now, we got Dustin Poirier yep. fighting for the title against Max. After that, I got Andre Olovsky. After that, um, I have – who else do I have? Da, 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 da. I think uh, Joanna's coming back in the, at the end of April, so we'll start her camp up with whoever she decides to, to smash next. Has she said – is she – because I know she talked about going back down to 115 instead of staying at 25. Um, yeah. Is that where she's going to go? Did she finalize on that? I don't really know. I think she's like here and there with it. I think whatever whatever fight matches for her the best, yeah. that's where she'll go. You know, she because she could fight really 125 or 115 sure. at the moment. Um, but I think that um, whatever is the best fight, she's gonna go to that weight class and make sure it happens. You know, I honestly just want to see her be dominant. You know, and and, and go out with the bang. She's a legend. Yeah. You know, she really, she's another one that really doesn't have anything else to prove. Yeah. You know, but that's my girl. So whatever she wants to do, I'm going to ride with her and we're going to make it happen. Yeah, no, I agree. She's she's earned it. She's made her bones. 
Now she yeah. deserves. I'd love to see her hanging. This is just me, armchair Joe Silva over here. I'd love to yeah. see her within striking distance of, you know, 25-35 instead of 25-15 because there are some yeah. fights yeah. at 35 also, <laughs> which is a bigger marquee division. She could probably get paid a bunch more to headline versus some of these fights or co-main on a title fight. Yeah, because it'll of, give me. It'll actually give me some room to, to build her body up a little bit more. I bet. Too as well. I, you yeah. could grow her. I mean, because she's the athleticism she has, the precision, the technique, the skill, the power already. But if yeah. you know, you add eight pounds or however much lean muscle tissue to that or explosivity yeah. to that. Well, she, fuck, man. The great thing is she'll be able to eat. <laughs> she'll be able to eat all the way up. You yep. know that. Much. You know, with that. I mean, you know more than anybody, man. It's it's very important when you're when you're calorie calorie deprived and you're trying to do your strength training sessions and then you're doing your sparring, you're doing grappling. <laughs> yep. She didn't have anything left in the tank when she's trying to go down 115. You know what I mean? And it's 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 uh it's kind of disheartening. You know, I, I mean, we kind of got it down to a better a better science now. You know, um, but at the end of the day, it's still 115 pounds, and she's still yeah. five foot seven, and she walks around about 138, 139. You know what I mean? Yeah. So there's no. It's like college wrestling. That's the the inside joke. Yeah. It's a it's a, it's an agreement that no one's going to be healthy. No one's going to oh, be 100%. Yeah. So like, I high five. We're both going to be at about 60, 70%. So let's go. Fair yeah, deal. Yeah. And with her going down the 115, man, and that was always impressive, how dominant she was at 115 while not truly being at the healthiest that she could be most likely, not feeling her best and being fed and being sustained and being fueled and, you know, because um, yeah. you're building, building up or breaking down. You know, yeah. that, that, that's as simple as it is. And a lot of athletes have to break down. In oh, order yeah. to compete, you know, at these weight classes and whatnot. So, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm uh, the no. move up advocate. <laughs> um, and what? So, Daru Strong, and that, that's kind of the last thing. And I know we'll get you out of here. I know you're busy. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. DaruStrong.com. That's the website. You online yep. programs, awesome content. YouTube channel right. crushing it. Instagram channel is crushing it. All sorts of um, upgrades. You certainly leveled up on your so your social media <laughs> game. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we, we got a team now, like I said, man, and uh, we're making it happen. I'm about to shoot a YouTube video now, yep. you know, so we're coming out with that. And I got a boxing program coming out. It's a 12-week boxing program. going to be out probably probably next month sometime. So okay. be on the lookout for that, guys. And, uh, you know, again, I'll be coaching on the floor like always and, you know, yep. and maybe do something with you, Mike. You know, do maybe a seminar. Absolutely. I think I'd love that. I'd love to get you up here. I'd love to get you to Jersey and uh... – pack the house with you you know and, and just so your seminar that'd be a little bit of, of instruction you know of, of conversation of lecture but on the floor training also so tell me yeah what yeah. with a seminar what what would people get what do they get when you put, put on like a two three hour seminar well it really depends man on what the subject of matter is you know i'll definitely give a presentation a whole lecture yep. and that could be a couple of hours there and then from there we can do a full-on practical which i'll go over my warm-ups i'll go over my special exercises yep. then i'll you know perfect technique on everybody you know especially with my main lifts that i utilize whether it be a sumo deadlift a zercher squat four press incline uh, bench press and, and then the special exercises, right? Because a lot of those are done wrong. Let's put it like that, yep. you know? So I want to make sure that everybody's getting the maximum amount of value with that time that I have. So we'll be going over programming. We'll be going over auto regulation. We'll be going over, you know, uh, concurrent energy systems, bioenergetic demands of the sport. We're we'll going over a lot of things that's going to help you and enhance your ability to coach, you know, any type of athlete, but mainly a lot of, a lot of combat sport athletes because – at the end of the day, it's 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 misunderstood, you know. But in general, we just go over everything, and we want to make sure that everybody is uh, is taken care of, whether it be combat sports or any athletic endeavor. What's your favorite movie? What's that? What's your favorite movie? What's my favorite movie? So it's either between Three Hundred okay. and Gladiator, you know. So I mean, I mean, I, guess I don't believe it. Clear. Yeah, like, like you would think maybe okay, the Notebook. That, like, I, <laughs> I could really I throw some people off and shit. I was thinking. But it's really not, man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, favorite comedian? Comedian? Yep. <sighs> Kevin Hart, man. Kevin Hart's my guy. Right on. Gotta get it. Um, music. What's your what, what what's your jam right now? Big set, heavy set, big day. Okay, so when I'm training, when I'm training, yep. it's got to be 
some hardcore rap, yep. hip hop, you know, um, like when and- I'm like on the move, like when I'm running or if I'm doing my conditioning, honestly, it's more of like classical music. Cause I can get into that mode a little bit better. Yep. Um, and then when I'm like getting after it, like heavy sets, yep. I need to go with some hardcore rock, some heavy metal to like get underneath heavy load and just smash it, man. What's your, what's your big time car? My what? Your, your, your big time car. So three years from now, when you're fucking big time, you can buy whatever the fuck you want to f- drive. What is it? And you know what? And Mike, man, I'm kind of like you, man. I like to live between my means, bro. You know, um, when I was a kid, I'd probably say like, you know, a, a, a Bentley or a Benz or something like, man, I don't give a fuck. Big time. Yep. You can give me a bike and I'll just make it happen. You know what I'm saying? Yep. I'm really that, that big into that. Nah. There you go. Three years from now, you're going to be riding some fucking Bentley. <laughs> you like, ah, fuck that shit. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> I, might be, shit. I, might, I might with the Rolex or whatever the fuck they wear nowadays. Right? With my hand out the, out the side, <laughs> saying what's up, Mike, you know? <laughs> <laughs> fuck yeah, man. You better. Yeah. Um, cool. All right, brother. Well, this was great. I, I know you're busy, man. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time to hop on out. Seminar, let's do it, man. Let, let's get it out of here. And let's. I got a couple cool. other things that we'll talk about. Um more stuff, more more good content too, more conversations. I want to have a couple topics to bring you in on. For sure, man. That's awesome. Hey, I appreciate everything, Mike, man. And uh, thanks for having me on. It's a true honor and a pleasure, bro. Brother, likewise, my man. Real happy we got together. Looking forward to big things, man. For sure, man. All right. All right, brother. Later. All right.